Well, thank you for these uh, kind remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know I've got a serious problem here to keep you awake after lunch, so uh, I will try and entertain you with a few slides here if uh, uh, we can uh, put them up. And here they are. Uh, <clears throat> so it's about innovation in Europe. And it's about evolution versus design. This is the slide set that I pinched from another one of my talks when, on intelligent machines, where I compare the biological intelligent machines from the artificial intelligent machines, which is uh, all the rage now, of course. Uh, and we have an opportunity <clears throat> to do better than evolution and design how we're going to do uh, <clears throat> innovation in Europe. Uh, during the next stage of um, uh, development. I have a small number of slides uh, touching on the following subjects. On uh, the status of European universities, which is actually quite good. On technology translation, which is not so good. Uh, on startups, uh, which is very good. We actually produce more startups than the US. On scale-ups, which is terrible. Uh, and then on the situation of venture capital and corporate venturing, which is also terrible. Uh, however, we're going to solve all these problems with the European Innovation Council. <laughs> so, let's start uh, with the state of our universities. Well, we can be proud of our universities uh, in the latest <clears throat> bit of research that the Times Educational Supplement uh, does every year out of the top thousand universities in the world. We've got 40% of them, more than any other region uh, in the world, I think, um, on a par, if not better, than the United States. We've also gone, undergone a remarkable cultural shift uh, at our universities, and I think this is not to be underestimated, because I've been doing this for over 30 years now, and when I first suggested to my dear uh, Cambridge professor colleagues uh, that we should start a company and maybe do something with this brilliant bit of research that they've done. The reaction that I got is, how dare you suggest that I sully my pure academic hands and do this pact with mammon? Uh, this has all but disappeared. Uh, people are now, there's this big cultural change that people at universities now are very supportive of uh, spin out startups trying to make something of our research uh, for the <clears throat> improvement of uh, the UK and Europe. So the, this entrepreneurial spirit is growing at really quite a clip. I was uh, really quite surprised to find uh, that uh, our Entrepreneurship Society at Cambridge University now is the largest student society, you know, ahead of rowing. So this is great. Uh, <clears throat> We also now have startup support at most of our European universities. This is being taken very seriously. We have technology transfer offices, we have mentoring, we've got business angel communities. So this ecosystem is gradually coming together. And <clears throat> it is also very important to uh, distinguish between two types of uh, innovations. There is the evolutionary breakthroughs and if these breakthroughs are <clears throat> evolutionary in nature, then large companies are quite capable of absorbing them and uh, improving their jet engines or their cars or whatever uh, because it fits into the, the way they think about the world. Sadly, the same is not true for revolutionary breakthroughs at our universities. Large companies are actually quite bad at dealing with uh, revolutionary uh, breakthroughs, and this is much better done in startups, and it's very important that the large companies uh, <clears throat> participate uh, in these small companies uh, that, of course, often fail, and often they get it wrong. They get overexcited about a new idea that actually doesn't work. But large companies need to engage in them, and the right way to engage uh, is through corporate venturing. Because one of the problems with large companies is if they like a small company, they often love it to death. And that's not very healthy either. 
you know, you want to keep these uh, small companies to be separate, to, to do their own thing and uh, create these amazing uh, breakthroughs uh, that sometimes they do. Now we come to technology transfer offices. Now, <clears throat> I'm just doing a, a bit of research uh, to work on a best practice paper for British universities together with Steve Caddick at the Wellcome Trust. And so far we have the buy-in from the uh, Royal Society. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to be the only venture capitalist in the world who is also an FRS. Uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, the <clears throat> Royal Academy of uh, Medicine, and the Wellcome Trust. So I hope when we finally produce this best practice paper, uh, some people, at least in Britain, will uh, listen to that. What it will say is it is based on two basic principles that we, we've all agreed talking to all the top universities uh, in Britain on how to do technology transfer. The first problem that we're trying to solve is the problem of IP. There is a tremendous amount of um, discussion on how we should deal with IP, tremendous uh, amount of bad blood that gets created by these long uh, negotiations on IP and our proposal will be something along the, the lines of the top um, US universities and some British universities already like uh, Imperial where it's a formula. It's not a negotiation, it's a formula and the formula is 5% of your company for, the, for all the IP that you can eat uh, up to uh, 2 million pounds into the company. Now the reason why we're so keen to make this formulaic, and it will, it's only roughly right, you'll never get this perfectly right. And of course there need to be exceptions for you know, spectacular breakthroughs. But on average, 5% seems to be as good a number as any. Uh, the much more important thing is that it is a formula and therefore the thing can be signed now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not in a month's time, not in a year's time, not in two years' time. Believe it or not, some of these IP negotiations go on for two years. And this has been one of the aggravations, of course, that we found when we did, uh, did our research. Uh, and two years later, it, it might be too late for the startup to make any impact on the market at all. So the fact that it is simple, everybody understands it, and it can be done now is very important on the IP. Second principle, unbundling. When we talk to these TTOs, they say, well, 5% for the IP might be all right, but look for all the hard work that we're doing for these companies. You know, we're mentoring them, we're, we're supporting them, we're, uh, you know, that's why we need 60% of the, in, in egregious cases, 60% of the company. And we say, well, fair enough. Uh, if <clears throat> you're really working so hard for these companies and you're doing this, uh, <clears throat> spectacularly uh, impressive work for the companies, then do it in competition with other people who might want to do it. So get your extra 10, 50% if you want to, if, uh, but against the competition of the local business community, the local VC community. So if there is a business angel who's willing to do it for 5% rather than 50%, then the normal market uh, forces are, are in place and there is a bit of a check and balances and will disallow the abuse of the monopoly on the IP to throw other services down the poor uh, entrepreneur's throat <clears throat> as does happen occasionally. In general, it must be said that TTOs actually do a, a respectable job, uh, but th they're all over the place. There is no best practice, and, and this is what we're trying to uh, work on, of course, with agreement, with, uh, together with all these uh, TTOs, at least in the Russell Group companies in the UK, but I hope that this could also then <clears throat> act as a template for um, <clears throat> TTOs all across Europe. <clears throat> so I've already made the point about revolutionary ideas should go into startups and evolutionary ideas should be licensed to large uh, companies. Scale-ups, this is our number one problem. We do not have a startup problem. Uh, we produce more startups than in the United States, but they don't grow. We've got a scale-up problem. And <clears throat> the solution to the scale-up problem, and of course uh, the, 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 the intrinsic problem that uh, we won't solve 
uh, overnight is the fact that the amount of venture capital per GDP uh, in Europe is a fifth of the amount of venture capital uh, in, in the United States. So we've got a problem there. Uh, the other problem, which is improving uh, enormously, is the availability of good managers. Uh, and that's really been holding us back for a very long time, but uh, <clears throat> this ecosystem has grown to a such an extent that I, I'm able to tell you the following interesting statistic of our own fund, uh, Amadeus Capital Partners. We did 17, 17% of our deals with serial entrepreneurs when we started with Amadeus One uh, almost 20 years ago now. This has risen to 70, 70 <coughs> of our deals we now do with serial entrepreneurs. Not that we prefer serial entrepreneurs, it's just that they are available to such, such an extent that there are now many more people doing it the second, third, fourth time <coughs> compared with 20 years ago. So there are two uh, two factors which have uh, improved dramatically. One is we've grown our own uh, entrepreneurial and management talent in Europe, so there's a whole undergrowth of these uh, capable of people now. But the second reason is uh, that we have managed to grow a number of billion dollar companies, or unicorns as they're called now, uh, in Europe, so we can now attract talent from all over the world. They don't have to believe that they are the first uh, people in the world to produce a unicorn in Europe. Uh, you know, we, in, in Cambridge, we didn't have a single unicorn uh, 20 years ago. We now have 15, only six of which had anything to do with me, uh, but they now exist uh, and we can attract uh, uh, the management talent. Also from Silicon Valley, one of uh, my great success stories, uh, Selexo, which is now Illumina, it's a $30 billion company uh, that was um, created by uh, a person that we managed to get back from Silicon Valley who ran a billion dollar division of ABI and, and we uh, uh, told John West um, that we had um, bad news and we had good news. And uh, he ran a billion dollar division uh, which had 90% of the gene sequencing in the world. And we said, the bad news is um, we're going to blow you out of the water with our instrument because it's so much better than anything that you've ever seen or sold. And the good news is we want you to do it. Uh, so he said, OK, <laughs> what is it? He came to Cambridge, looked at our technology, which was the uh, sequencing biosynthesis technology of Selexa. Uh, being an MIT graduate, he had the brains to realize that that really was a, a, a revolution. And he did it, and it's uh, now responsible for 90% of the gene sequencing in the world. Uh, <clears throat> we also need larger growth funds. Uh, <clears throat> we need to be able to back those of the many startups that we produce in Europe that are ready for big time with a, five, a 50 million uh, euro check and not a 5 million euro check. And, uh, I'm working on uh, uh, helping uh, with this to bring some of the bigger growth funds into Europe. Importantly, as you see, we do have a, a VC problem in terms of the amount of venture capital, uh, <clears throat> but the EU is helping. Uh, there is now a 400 million euro fund of funds, uh, which helps uh, trigger the market <clears throat> to actually multiply that by a factor of four. So we will get a number of funds uh, totaling around 1.6 billion because of that European initiative that was uh, <clears throat> uh, put together by Carlos Moidos. Very pleasingly, uh, corporate venture capital is growing in Europe at quite a pace. We've got Bosch, we've got Siemens, we've got a number of uh, French companies. Uh, and it's corporate venture capital uh, of quite a different nature to the corporate venture capital which we had around the year 2000 when all the corporates felt that they now needed to engage with small companies but didn't have a clue how to do it. Uh, you know, 17 years later, 18 years later, uh, they have learned a lot on what to do, what not to do, 
uh, that this is a way of getting a window on technologies and <clears throat> an ability to place lots of bets, lots of small bets, and watch what happens. And then if there is one that works particularly well, they can always get closer and eventually even buy them if they feel that this uh, fits into their strategy particularly well. Probably the most important event, though, is after decades of lagging behind the US in the venture returns, the latest <coughs> venture capital returns in Europe are now on a par uh, with the venture capital returns in the US, and that's what finally makes the market uh, <coughs> excited and makes uh, the money flow into Europe as well. So let me finish with just a few remarks on the European Innovation Council. <clears throat> We've seen that universities in Europe actually do quite well. We've also seen one of the most successful uh, European initiatives with the European Research Council. Now, why has the European Research Council become such a phenomenal success? It is very simple at the end of the day, excellence. It had that one criteria of supporting excellence. <clears throat> this meant that even humble universities like Cambridge University will now tell you how many ERC grants they have as a sign, as a measure of the quality of the university uh, that you're in. So it's now a, an accepted quality standard all across uh, uh, Europe. And if somebody in Romania gets an ERC grant, everybody else in Euros knows he competed with the best uh, universities in Europe. This guy must be really good. His, we, we listen to uh, his research. Uh, we will uh, work with this guy. <clears throat> we want to apply the same discipline of excellence to the European Innovation Council. Again, we want to make it single company, single country, excellence only. How did the ERC achieve that? Well, I talked at great lengths to people who built up the ERC, in particular uh, Helga Novotny as well, who is a, a, a fellow Austrian. And she said, finally, it was the ERC board personally getting on the phone, convincing the opinion leaders in academia to become evaluators, to become part of the evaluation process of ERC so that people really knew that if there was an ERC grant, it was uh, really world class. This is what we have to do with the EIC. <clears throat> We've got to go to the key opinion leaders in each of our uh, <clears throat> technology clusters be they Berlin, be it Paris, be it Stockholm, Helsinki, uh, or London, go to the opinion leaders, convince them to join in this uh, pan-European effort to pick the best innovations out of uh, our universities and make them work for Europe, PLC. We have a, a pilot running now. It's not a, a, a small pilot. It's uh, 700 million, I think, uh, this year. It, uh, the proposal is that the EIC will be a key part of Horizon Europe, which is the name of uh, the follow-on uh, framework program to the Horizon 2020, which will start in 2021 and run for seven years. And we're all looking forward to this Thursday to see what uh, uh, the decision will be. But we hope it will be a uh, a positive one, and it will have uh, <clears throat> a blended way of providing finance. So two of the objectives that we've set ourselves at the EIC is, number one, to simplify things for uh, our companies uh, in Europe. Uh, some companies are bewildered by the, by the breadth of um, support uh, uh, projects that we have uh, at the EU, we want to simplify this and just have one port of call, at least for EU um, applications. The second thing we want to do is provide a blended um, set of our financial uh, 
uh, tools, starting with grants uh, via uh, guaranteed loans all the way to equity. It is important to point out uh, that the equity part will only be a small uh, equity part and in no way is trying to compete with the marketplace. On the contrary, it is very much uh, has to be seen as a nucleation uh, effort to help build the syndicate uh, for, for these companies because venture capital works best if there is a like-minded syndicate uh, supporting the companies, uh, of course, not just uh, in Europe, but uh, expanding their reach uh, uh, all across the world. We've written a report that is uh, available to all of you. It's called the, the um, European Innovation uh, Council report. We've made 14 detailed recommendations on how we're going to do this, uh, how we're going to implement this basic idea of excellence and a blended finance uh, uh, in these uh, 14 recommendations. And it's all about accelerating breakthrough uh, innovation through funding, awareness, scale, and talent. It's a very nice acronym called FAST. Uh, and uh, you can look that up on the web. So in conclusion, I made a few remarks on the quality of your European universities, which is high. Technology translation, which really needs uh, improving. Startups, of which we've got enough. Scale-ups, of which we've not got enough. And then the improvements, both in the ecosystem of venture capital, corporate venturing. And we hope that the European uh, Innovation Council uh, can become the hub to help uh, this team sport, because a team sport it is. Thank you very much.